two, The Drummer and the Great Mountain Lord, a podcast where we share effective tips and practices for working with adults ADD, ADHD in a natural, effective way without the use of medications. Each episode, join me, your host, Batman Saram, along with the author of The Drummer and the Great Mountain, Michael Joseph Ferguson. Join Michael and myself in an interactive discussion of sharing our stories as we journey together in transforming what can be the gift of being what we call hunter types. This podcast is intended to be your audio companion to the book written by Michael, who joins me each episode where we both will strive to foster dialogue, give you our personal insights, and share both of our experiences on this similar path that we are all on. Our intention and hope is that along with the book, this podcast gives you an additional perspective as you listen to us delve deeper into each chapter of the book to give you even more tools to go along with what it is that you are reading. Visit us at drummerandthegreatmountain.com to purchase the book and look for more tools, tips, and updates, as well as giving us feedback on this podcast. Join our growing global community of creative types, entrepreneurs, and out-of-the-box thinkers on our shared journey. Welcome to the Drummer and the Great Mountain Podcast. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Michael Joseph Ferguson. How are you? Uh, On today's episode, uh, we will be celebrating the seven-year anniversary of the publication of The Drummer in the Great Mountain. It's a big day. Uh, I've been feeling it coming on for the last couple months, uh, and we're going to be, I'm going to be reflecting a little bit on the backstory going into the book. Um, some reflections on what was written and uh, how it is connected with all of you and and where we're going. Where are we going with this podcast? Where are we going with our community that has grown around the podcast? So really looking forward to sharing this with you. And uh, I know I haven't been on the mic in a while. Uh, I think our last episode was uh, the interview with Kathleen Lockyer, which was fantastic. We got a lot of great feedback from that one. If you haven't listened to it, please go back and listen. It is a really wonderful episode and some really beautiful insights on, on the power of nature connection and how that supports us when we're wired it this way as ADHD folk, as hunter types. So uh, check that one out. And uh, yeah, some of you have reached out and said, uh, are you okay? <laughs> is everything all right? It's been a couple months. So um, I always love getting, that was just the care involved in reaching out was, uh, was wonderful. So thank you so much for checking in. Everything is good. Been very busy. Um, we just wrapped up a workshop. Um, I've got a full coaching practice. So um, that is that takes up the bulk of my time. Had some talks and um, yeah, just catching up after a very uh, intense full on 2020 And still, you know, we're all reeling from COVID and and how that's affected our lives. Um, And we had a very busy year in 2020, busiest year we've ever had. So I actually needed to take a little space to catch up with myself and just catch up with life. Uh, And still in the process, going to be going on vacation in about a week and very much looking forward to that. So be forewarned, this episode is not really a tips suggestions episode. Uh, It is more of a celebration and a little bit of backstory. So if you're coming just for that, you might want to skip this episode and we will be back on that track in the next episode. So the book, The Drummer in the Great Mountain, was officially published on September 14th, 2014. Uh, and it's, I started the book and when I was looking back at the notes, I started the book in September of 2010. So it took me almost exactly four years to write and publish the book. Uh, I had assumed going into writing the book that it would take me maybe six months. (laughs) And I was woefully underestimating how long it would take. Um, and that is the wonderful trick our hunter type mind plays on us of like, oh, you know what? You can do this. It's only, it's going to, it's going to take like what, a couple weeks, maybe a couple months. And if we didn't have that part of our brain, many of us would never have started on some of the adventures we've started on, right? If we really took in, if, if you really sat down and looked at, here's, a, here's actually how long it's going to take, you would never have started. 
And so it's this wonderful trick that our brain plays on us, hunter types, that leads us to, I think, innovating and jumping out into the unknown in, in ways that other people would not necessarily. So that part of my brain was definitely active when making the decision to write the book. That little trickster in my brain uh, was very helpful in motivating me to write the book. Um, so I've been looking back and, and reflecting on what was my motivation for writing the book? What, what kind of initial what was the initial impulse to write the book? And um, I think primarily I saw that there was a perspective on ADHD that was not out there. And it, and it really it did it didn't exist, not in the way that it was put in the book. Um, and it's it was based on what worked for me primarily starting there, but then also what I was seeing really supportive in working with my coaching clients. And primarily, I can distill that down to the perception that ADHD as a neurological type and not a disorder, viewing it from that lens and taking in us hunter types, which we'll talk about in a second, that term, as um as human beings, whole human beings, and not something that is broken and an, or an aberration of nature. Um, and so just having a deeper way to look at life versus, quote unquote, having a disorder and not exclusively viewing ourselves in clinical terms. Uh, how, how do we get ourselves up in the morning? How do we have a, a view of ourselves that's empowering, that strengthens us, but has, that is realistic and, and assesses who we are in relation to the world around us. How do we survive? How do we interact with others? And what are the tools we need to optimize ourselves so that we can function with the gifts that we've been given? So the goal of the book primarily was to help us re-perceive ourselves in relation to the world around us with this particular neurological wiring. And so the question is, what if you weren't broken? What if you were something very specific? What if you weren't uh, some kind of aberration of nature? What if this wiring had a purpose to the world, to society? And that changes the whole game. That changes your perception of who you are and how you relate with the world. And it's no longer about being broken. It's about how do I, what do I need to survive? What do I, what are the tools I need to survive? How do I how do I navigate this world? And then you learn strategies. Then you learn understanding how brain chemistry works. How does the brain chemistry for us work? How, how do we um, actively pursue the things that we care about without getting constantly derailed by uh, our inattentiveness or our challenge with focus? So starting with the title um, and how I approach the book, I'd say there was one primary influence for that. And it was inspired by one single talk by Michael Mead. And the talk was called Thresholds of Change, Finding Purpose and Inner Authority in Troubling Times. And I just looked up on Amazon. You can still get a cassette of it on Amazon. So if you have a cassette player, you might want to get it. I don't think he has it available on his website, but you might want to check it out. So Michael Mead is, and I want to put this, I want to read from the website because it's so hard to define who Michael Mead is. He's such a, uh, what he does is very um it brings in so many different streams of influence that it's hard to describe who he is. So he's a storyteller, he's an author, he's a scholar of mythology, anthropology, and psychology. Uh, and he started uh, Mosaic Voices, which is an organization that works with inner city kids, and basically it's a community building organization. He's, he's been doing that for many years. But the talk, this talk just blew my mind open. Um, and what was so unique about it was it wove story, poetry, Jungian psychology, science, spirituality. It all just kind of wrapped it together in this beautiful uh, soup of, of just had all these beautiful flavors to it. That it was just so rich and dense and inspiring that you could just keep going back. And I listened to it over and over again. And I get and still to this day, I'll listen to it. And I'll go, oh, I didn't even catch that piece. 
Um, it's, it was just an amazing talk. And so when I approached the book, I thought, I want to do it like that. I want to have poetry. I want to have story. I want to center it around a central theme that's a story instead of it having it be another clinical book about ADHD. Um, and so that's what I set out to do. And that was tough because it, it, it's a model that didn't, doesn't, I didn't have a lot of reference for it. Uh, there was him, and I'd say the other primary reference was maybe um, Robert Bly wrote a book called Iron John, where he took a, 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 a story, a, a Grimm's fairy tale, and then went through that story and then reflected on each little piece of that story. And that was sort of a thread to it. And then I just had to just jump in and just start writing. Um, but the, the key piece um, that specifically made it from that talk, Thresholds of Change, into the book is one is the title of the book is part of one of the stories that he told in that talk. It was one, that story had like multiple pieces and the first part of it was um, this, this, this part called, the story itself was called The Drummer and it goes to this long storyline, but the very first part of the story is about someone facing a giant and the metaphor was um, facing the giant, the thing that crushes you in your life learning to befriend the giant and then finding a way for that thing that most crushes you to be the same thing that leads you to your intended destination. And I thought, well, that thread, I just kind of went back to that talk and I went, oh, that's it. That's the perfect metaphor to wrap the book around. And obviously hunter type was in the mix, but that really was the central metaphor of the book. And that then generated the title drummer in the great mountain. So the goal was to pull together tools and resources that had not been directly connected to ADHD support that I found really valuable and I thought all of you might find valuable as well. So just to go down the list, the work of nonviolent communication and needs awareness, uh, the life's work of Dr. Marsha Rosenberg, as you know, I love it. It works. It's useful. It, I've been using it now since 1999. It has been an integral part of my coaching practice, and it is such a useful tool for self-reflection, journaling, understanding your, your core motivations, and more importantly, how do you develop effective strategies that really bring you satisfaction, uh, as well as just an amazing communication tool. Then there's the work of Dr. Kevin McCauley on the science of addiction, understanding what's happening in the brain when someone gets addicted to a substance or behavior. So I was able to take his work and extrapolate so much for understanding how we function when we are wired with ADHD. What does it mean to have a sensitive brain chemistry? What in our brain, um, leaves us open for addiction? What, what leaves us open for being caught by stimuli? So much of his work I was able to extrapolate and understand how dopamine functions in the brain. What does it mean to have less dopamine receptors? What does that lead you to? What are, what are the tendencies? What is the restlessness that comes from that? Why is it that a stimulant then affects you a certain way? Um, this His work was pivotal in that. And he doesn't directly speak to ADHD. I don't, he's, I don't think I've heard any. He may have mentioned it in passing a couple of times. But there are some key resources there that I was able to um, have a deeper understanding of what is going on in the neurotransmitters of the brain. Why is it that um, people who get addicted can't stop themselves? What's going? Why is the wiring so deep that they actually need to be physically removed from the substance so their brain can, can readjust its dopamine levels to come back to center again when people go to rehab. What's going on there? So all of that information was so valuable in writing the chapter on the brain chemistry of ADHD. Um, so again, I pulled from a, a resource not in the ADHD world um, that was really helpful in understanding the ADHD mind. And then there were tools like mind mapping, which I had been using since 1999, that I had not seen being used um, 
I don't think people understood how to use that tool as a support for ADHD. And I'd say this has become one of our specialties when we do our workshops. And I will most likely be expanding that work as we move forward and probably developing some courses around it. Because um, what I've found is it's the tool for hunter types in getting clear about what we need to do. How do we prioritize? How do we break a task down? Um, you can do that with other tools and just from writing or even apps, but not to the degree that you can with mind mapping. It's such a useful tool that seems just hand in glove with how we're wired. And that's the feedback that I've gotten over and over again from people that have taken the workshops that have adopted a lot of the, uh, the tool sets that I brought in. Uh, in the time management uh, chapter of the book, and then also when I uh, re-released um, ADHD time management as a free ebook, uh, which you can get on Amazon. Um, using that tool, uh, I've gotten so much feedback that that's been one of the key tools that has been um, pivotal in helping many of you get a handle on planning. And then, of course, there's the hunter farmer theory. There's the like the hunter type metaphor that all of you have really like gotten into and, and, and have resonated with and are using with your family. <laughs> um, that Tom Hartman's work in bringing that theory into the ADHD world cannot be understated. The out of the box thinking that led to the hunter farmer theory is astounding. And I still look back and go, wow, that was an amazing, like, how did he get from here to there? So those were the influences, and I think one of the other driving forces behind the book and this podcast is having tools to become more self-aware, cultivating mindfulness. When we're in reaction, we cause harm to others and ourselves. When we cultivate mindfulness, we have choice, and we're back in the driver's seat. So those were the motivations for writing the book. Uh, again, it took four years to write. And um, but there was much support that came as I was writing the book as well as in publishing the book. And I wanted to speak to a few people that were instrumental in making the book possible. First and foremost, and most importantly, my partner, Cuesta. Uh, how do I I don't even know what to say. Like she is the heart of all that we do here. Uh, we got together. Um, in 2012. And so as she continually says, I was pregnant with a book and it made me a little crazy because I like, I have to get this book out into the world. And I don't know if she was fully on board in the beginning, but she has become a very proud mother of a book. <laughs> as she says, we say that, oh, our little book has gotten out into the world. And as like months have gone by, we're like, okay, it's still in its infancy. It's still kind of getting its legs. Uh, and now we're like, okay, now it's out in the world. It's doing its thing. It's connecting. It's It's been fully birthed and uh, is a mature adult at this point. So thank you so much, Questa, for being there, being such a loyal, understanding companion uh, through the insanity that was finishing the book and getting it out into the world. And as many of you have connected with her, she's such a, a bright light and kind soul that also keeps the ground plane handled um, as we do workshops and, and processing book orders and running the uh, coaching business, the, it just the list goes on and on and on. So my dearest Questa, I am so grateful for you. And then there's Bam and Saram, my occasional co-host at this point, but uh, my co-host uh, throughout the early episodes. Uh, can't say enough, man. You, uh, you showed up at the right time. And our jam sessions uh, built this whole podcast and the community around it. And my, uh, I don't know what to say, just deepest gratitude for your spirit, your energy, your vitality, your insights. Um, I was blessed to see him last night. We don't see each other as much lately because of COVID and we're, both of our lives are really busy. But um, soul brother and um, just my gratitude is immense. And of course, my family, who was always there, and I lost my mom a couple of years ago, as many of you know, as I mentioned on the podcast, and my journey around that was, um, was very intense. And I, again, had to re to double up on all of the things that um, 
we talk about on this podcast, it, I had to use all the tools to just make it through that because it was so difficult losing my mom. The one thing she would tell me as I was growing up and I had had challenges and my sensitivity and all the things that came up for me growing up being wired this way, you got, you all know what you went through. Uh, it wasn't easy, especially in my um, grammar school years that she, she said, you know, being sensitive and being in the world is difficult, but it brings great gifts as well. Uh, but having someone that understood the struggle, even though they weren't necessarily wired that way, was, a, was uh, I can't even express, it was such a great gift. And the one other person I really want to acknowledge is our friend, me and Questa's friend, Annabeth, who passed away very soon after my mom died. And um, the photo for this podcast episode is a photo she took, I'd say, a few months before she passed that she had texted it over to me. And um, she hosted the first, the, basically the book release party happened at her house. And she has a big, beautiful house. And her and her husband um, were gracious enough to host the, the event. Um, she participated in the first workshop. She was the first workshop participant. She insisted on paying, on, paying for it. Um, and it's her birthday today. I'm recording this on September 12th, 2021. Um, and uh, so I just want to give a special shout out to Annabeth. She was such a kind, gentle, and encouraging soul extremely creative. She was one of us. And, um, so thank you, Annabeth. I know she's looking down on us and, and supporting our work. So after the book was published, so I often say that the book was released to deafening silence. <laughs> no one was really, we sold a couple copies of the book. Um, but there was no real interest. I had a uh, a feeler out to actually get an article written in the Huffington Post about the book. But then what ha ended up happening was the uh, because the column in, in the Huffington Post was more about yoga and um, in that world, that the editors thought it didn't quite fit with the the column. I, I, that was kind of what I gleaned from it because um, I had written the article, it was submitted, and it didn't go anywhere. And it, and it kind of stretched out for a couple months, which was actually really helpful because I had this in the back of my mind, like, okay, that article is going to come out. And then finally it didn't come out and it got published on um, on the blog for uh, the, the writer. And I really appreciated that. Um, but um, it was enough of a carrot to keep me going. Um, but what really built the community was the podcast. And again, Bam and showing up at just the right time. And we would uh, basically do our coaching session. I would do a coaching session with him. And then we would just go straight from that into the podcast. And we committed on making the podcast alive and connected to what we were experiencing in the moment. And then slowly it grew. And I was starting to get surprised of how many downloads we were getting. I'm like, oh my gosh. And we'd he be hearing from people around the world. And I was just like, wow, I had no expectations of where this would go. I thought maybe we'd do it for a couple months and that would be it. But more importantly, I started to hear your stories and getting emails from people saying they, they were in tears listening to the podcast and reading the book. And the note that I kept getting over, and I still get it constantly from people, almost on a daily basis, I get emails saying, this someone finally gets me that it released me from the shame that I've been carrying my whole life. And I can't uh, express how deeply those emails move me to this day. And so that's what keeps me going is I read your emails. I keep a, a folder of all the emails that I get. And it's, I can't believe how many emails are in there. It's, it's, it's astounding to me. So I just want to express my sincere gratitude to all of you who took the time to write and share your experiences with me because it keeps me going. So in looking back at the last seven years, one of the most exciting trends I've seen um, come to fruition is the use of the term neurodiverse and neurodiversity and seeing the ADHD community embrace that term and also to see that that term is now being integrated into organizations. And I hope in some small part, we were part of the wave that pushed that forward. Um, when we first started, we were pretty much the lone voices in the wilderness saying, you know, look, this is ADHD is not 
just a disorder. It is, we are, this is a, there's a bigger way to look at this. This is a bigger way to see how the people wired this way can contribute to society because of the way we're wired instead of in spite of it. And I've already been asked to give talks to businesses and organizations that have a neurodiversity group within the organization. And to me, that's the most exciting trend that I've seen uh, come about in the last seven years. And um, moving forward, I want to keep going with feeding that wave and feeding that trend because I feel like that signifies real growth and maturity and viewing us and our community with respect and also that we are given the tools we need to really thrive within the organizations we work for. So in looking ahead, uh, we have so many podcast topics that we haven't covered yet that I'm really excited to cover. I'm personally most excited about going deeper into the positive strengths that we have as hunter types. How do we get into our creative states? How do we sustain those states? How have you experienced those states in your life? I'm also really looking forward to some guests that I've already spoken to that I'd like to have on the podcast. So uh, in the next few months, there'll be some pretty interesting interviews as well. So I want to leave you with a piece of writing from E.E. E. Cummings called A Poet's Advice. It really relates strongly to, I think, the lives we all lead and how we as hunter types struggle to maintain our center and what makes us unique and not be crushed by the world around us, to keep that fire burning inside us that is unique to us, that will not be subjugated by um, the expectations of modern society. Thank you all so much for being on the journey this far. Uh, let's keep going. I'm looking forward to connecting with all of you soon and hopefully in person at some point. And I'll leave you with this. So love you all. And until next time, be well. A poet is somebody who feels and who expresses their feelings through words. This may sound easy. It isn't. A lot of people think or believe or know they feel, but that's thinking or believing or knowing not feeling. And poetry is feeling, not knowing or believing or thinking. Almost anybody can learn to think or believe or know, but not a single human being can be taught to feel. Why? Because whenever you think or believe or know, you're a lot of other people. But the moment you feel, you're nobody but yourself. And to be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its best night and day to make you everybody else means to fight the hardest battle which any human being can fight and never stop fighting. As for expressing nobody but yourself in words, that means working just a little harder than anybody else who isn't a poet can possibly imagine. Why? because nothing is quite as easy as using words like somebody else. We all of us do exactly this nearly all of the time. And whenever we do this, we're not poets. So if at the end of your first 10 or 15 years of fighting and working and feeling, you find you've written one line of poem, you'll be very lucky indeed. And so my advice to all young people who wish to become poets is, do something easy, like learning to blow up the world. Unless you're not only willing, but glad to feel and work and fight till you die. Does this sound dismal? It isn't. It's the most wonderful life on earth. Or so I feel. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to learn more about the book, The Drummer in the Great Mountain, visit drummerinthegreatmountain.com. To join us on social media, click the links at the top of the homepage. 
Help us spread the word. We're a small press and reviews really help. If you've been enjoying the podcast or the book, consider writing a review on iTunes, Amazon, Goodreads, or your podcast app. If you're new to the podcast and want to quickly get up to speed on the concepts we discuss, check out our free five-day mini course. Visit drummerinthegreatmountain.com forward slash mini course. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover on future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. Please send us an email at info at drummerinthegreatmountain.com.